think that might be the official start of our webinar. Um, hi, everyone. I am so excited to be here with you. Um, I am Leah Triplett Harrington. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the curator here at Now and There, and I'm very excited, excited to spend this lunch hour with you all for our conversation on what makes a monument. Um, first in a series of conversations on public monuments that we are co-hosting with the Goethe Institute in Boston. Um, so before we begin today, I want to acknowledge that um, both Now and There and the Goethe Institute of Boston are on the unceded lands of the Massachusetts people. We acknowledge the Massachusetts people past, present, and future, and our projects and events must acknowledge that it was that Boston is founded upon the exclusions and erasures of many indigenous peoples. Um, I think keeping that in mind will be especially pertinent today as we talk about um, symbolism and, and constructions of public space. Um, and I think I, it's really great to see so many names that I recognize come into the, into the room here, um, and I'm thrilled to be here in conversation with um, so many exciting practitioners in the field um, talking about this subject that's been really part of the, the news cycle and on a lot of people's minds in the last few years, which are public monuments. Um, we at Now and There are dedicated to temporary and site-specific public artwork, which um, so that's how we got our name. Um, we are dedicated to opening up public space for contemporary art and dialogue and reimagining what our public spaces could be. And while most monuments are permanent or long term, uh, which is outside of the work we do, they do shape how people interact with um, our communities and public space. So while our work is not necessarily monument making, um, we do our, we are constantly thinking about monuments and their meaning and how they're kind of shaping experience in our, in our city of Boston. Um, and while this conversation is necessary, necessarily local and thinking about what's in our specific neighborhoods, um, it's also very global, right? It's, it's really kind of throughout the world. Um, so we're really excited to be in conversation with the Goethe Institute, which is a really strong record and history of cultivating a critical dialogue around monuments um, and memorials across the world. So with that, I'm going to pass it to my colleague um, at the Goethe Institute, Annette Klein, who is going to introduce our moderator, Devin Morris. Um, and, our, and we'll get started. Thank you, Leah. And uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, also, good evening to those who may be joining um, from across the pond. Um, I am Annette Klein and program curator here at the Good Institute Boston. And um, I'm thrilled to welcome you as well to this first conversation in our panel series. Um, for those of you who don't know us, the Good Institute is the cultural institute of the German Federal Republic. Um, and is dedicated to fostering international cultural dialogue between Germany, Europe, and, also, and the rest of the world. And for us in Boston, that means um, dialogue between Germany, Europe, and New England in particular. Um, as a global organization with institutions located all over the world in over 80 countries, we have um, watched in the past years as people in many countries around the world have questioned um, their monuments and, and are demanding that they be taken down. Um, and as the, the German social scientist Alieda Asman said, monuments are mirrors of society. And we see people in Brazil, Portugal, Africa, Germany, and here in Boston, of course, are looking into these mirrors, these, these monuments, and finding that they, they no longer uh, recognize themselves there, or perhaps never recognize themselves in these, um, these monuments and, and aren't finding their narratives there. Um, and what happens when artists enter into this process? Um, artists who are often the ones who are pushing the discussion forward, um, as we've found, imagining new narratives and scenarios for the future, and that for us is what this panel is about, is uh, initiating, initiating a uh, transnational conversation between artists who are thinking about monuments, what they can be and, and what they are. Um, and so we're really excited to be partnering with uh, Now and There, um, which has been so successful in engaging the local community here in Boston around redefining what public space is um, redefining the, as a space for art and also for dialogue. And uh, they are providing um, this wonderful local context for this 
conversation. And we're thrilled to have this wonderful group of panelists, um, accomplished speakers from Germany, from Boston, um, here today to engage in this, con this first conversation with us. Um, so without much further ado, I will start things off by introducing our moderator today, um, Devin Morris is co-founder and executive director of the Teachers Lounge. Uh, the Teachers Lounge was founded in 2018 and is dedicated to creating and curating spaces intended to increase the recruitment, revitalization, and the retention of educators of color around the greater Boston area. And Devon has um, an extensive background in, in marketing and social entrepreneurship um, and he this has fueled um, a very multifaceted career um, working with schools in New York City and in Boston area in many different roles. Um, and he also sits on several local and national coalitions um, that also supports the diversification of the teacher workforce. So I would like to pass on to you, Devin. Um, just before I do, I'd like to encourage you in the audience to participate with sharing your comments and questions in the chat. And uh, um, Devin will feed those into the conversation as he can. So Devin, on to you. Thanks so much, Annette. Uh, and thank you to the Guta Institute and now and their team for having me. Thank you to our incredible panelists who you'll get to meet in a moment. Uh, as noted, my name is Devin Morris. I'm the co-founder and executive director of the Teachers Lounge. We are a nonprofit seeking to recruit, revitalize, and retain educators of color throughout the greater Boston area and beyond. Um, though I reside in Boston, I am on a bit of a short sabbatical. I'm traveling up and down the East Coast with my four-year-old daughter, uh, getting to reconnect with family and friends that we haven't seen in, in, in a number of years and some she has never met before. So I just give you that precursor so just to note that at any point, if my travel partner pops in, she may say hello, and then we'll send her back on her way. Um, really excited to join you all today and moderate this conversation on what makes a monument. Um, before we dive in, would like to just start off by what um, we call our community guidelines. And so I'm going to read that for you, but it's also going to be dropped in the chat for us to sort of enter into this space with similar frameworks. And so that, those community guidelines, I acknowledge and embrace that I might meet people of different backgrounds and perspectives than my own. I understand that my perspective might be challenged. I hope that they're challenged, honestly, in this space so that we can push this work forward. Um, and I'm committed to active listening and engaging with the community present. And further, I will share my own personal experience and not on behalf of others. So we will speak from the I uh, in today's conversation. And so today, uh, we'll explore uh, moments, movements, and monuments with our guest panelists with both local and international perspectives, uh, depending on where you are calling in from, perspectives and context. And so I'm so excited to introduce or reintroduce you to our guest panelists in just a moment. But first, with the recognition that folks are entering into today's conversation with varying experiences, perspectives, and awareness of today's conversation on monuments, I thought I'd just share a few links and resources for context. Now, you are welcome to review these links now or later. I simply ask uh, if you are someone very much like me who struggles with multitasking, um, then I'm going to ask that you click the links so that you have them open in your browser, uh, but you come back to them when you're able to give them your undivided attention so that you don't miss out on uh, our panelists' contributions today. And so the first link is a list of monuments in Boston. And I want you to please disregard this title that says best monuments. No one here today is saying that these are the best monuments. And such a title is uh, both equally problematic and telling of the landscape in Boston as it pertains to historic monuments and the histories in general uh, that we prioritize and highlight. Uh, but I'm gonna leave that good, rich conversation for, for this panel discussion. The second link that we're gonna share is a list of monuments removed during the George Floyd protests. And so we'll reference both the moment and the movement of monument removals in our discussion today. And so if there's a monument that you hear today in our discussion, wanna quickly reference, here's a somewhat helpful though not completely comprehensive resource. Some national context. 
according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, there were 59 Confederate statues and nine markers or plaques that were removed from public land in 19 US states between June of 2015 and July of 2020. So 59 statues and, and plaques. They reported that 160 monuments were removed in 2020 alone after George Floyd's death, more than the prior four years combined. And about 704 Confederate monuments remained on public land. For, for local context in Boston, the statue of Lincoln with formerly enslaved men at his feet was removed in December of 2020. Um, and the third and final link that we're gonna share with you all is an article from the New Yorker and it's titled, How Cities in the American North Can Reckon with Their Monuments. It was published in uh, October of 2021. And so regardless of where we each stand on the topic of monument removals, I wanna begin our discussion with an excerpt from this article where the writer W. Ralph Eubanks states, Boston's monuments reveal the complexities of American history and its mutability, but the power of monuments rests in their permanence. And the question that remains in Boston and across this country, and I would even push uh, na uh, internationally, is how we can amend uh, the American story through our monuments without tearing them all down. And so to our panelists today, I'm gonna to ask that you introduce yourself, give some insight into your role and your work, share how you got involved with monuments and their making, and what is the significance of amending our histories through our monuments? Lamerti, we'll start with you. Lamerti, I'm gonna ask that you unmute yourself, sorry. Thank you, first of all, for inviting me to this conversation. Thank you for that introduction, Devin, and all those here at Now and There and the Ghost Institute. Um, it is my pleasure to participate here with Ulf and have a discussion about a very critical issue. Um, I, as a visual activist, have been involved with monuments for over 20 years, uh, having had the opportunity to present one of my own in the Boston Commons that had to do with the uh, with neighborhood development and kinetic work uh, in a 20 foot sculpture that was monumental in my art practice for sure. But in terms of the ideas of what we present in monuments, I want to say that my work and practice is built on history, memory, uh, the power of art to support a future that we're moving into. And what I call my work is save me from my amnesia. So um, with that, I'd like to say that I have been an artist in the realm of, uh, of social justice for quite a while. Um, and right now my screen is jumping and I don't know why it is. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what's happening here, but at any rate, I do want to discuss that on a visual level, we come into spaces that are very powerful in the public arena and the public landscape. And with that, um, I'm, my, I'm not able to get my screen at all here now. I don't know what happened, um, but, as far as looking at the landscape of Boston, I am director of education for the Museum of African American History. And with that, I have been able to uh, affect a practice that is history informed. Okay, maybe I can share my screen now, I'm not sure. Can you all see that? Are you able to see it? Not yet, Lamerchi. Oh my goodness. What happened? Okay. Oh, there it is. Okay. I'll select it and now I can share. Now my talk will there we go. make a, a lot more sense. Okay, so uh, having been involved uh, for over uh, 15 years in what is monumental space, um, I began to uh, investigate what people bring to a monument and who has been the, uh, the person involved in um, 
erecting a monument or uh, committees or governments, municipalities, and where the power of that rest in telling our stories. So the spaces that we occupy has been this cauldron of storage spaces of memory, how we take up space, whether it is in a formal spatial design or, or whether it is in formal space with moving kind of monumental thinking and space. And so these rest in the, uh, the cauldron of equity and justice. And when we look at what is on the Boston Common, for instance, we see public landscape that has been involved in um, the celebration of uh, people, places, and events and moments. And this crystallized uh, arena brings us to sculptures like Christmas Attics. Uh, at the Christmas Addicts Monument that was started by a man on your, your right here at the top, whose name is Lewis Hayden, formerly enslaved man, born in 1811. Um, and in 1857, he wanted to honor Christmas Addicts, who was the first man to die in the American Revolution, who was of Black and Indigenous extract. He wanted to say that we need to raise this as there is no representation of uh, a black and indigenous people that early on centuries uh, before we are in now. And what results is a 30 year battle for bringing forth this, this sculpture in the city because it had to have all the men who, had, who perished with Christmas as the first man to die in the American Revolution and uh, for other white men, it had to have that. And then as it evolved, it became a part of a city discussion and a state discussion with a parade that celebrated its moment of reveal in 1888. So um, as we look at what is it that brings these about, I have found that in my investigation that it is petitions to state governments and legislatures to possibly affect something coming from a community voice, but that the enslaved, the formerly enslaved people are bringing this one about was really critical to me. As we look at uh, the next sculpture rendition, I in, uh, had a project with students New Urban Monument, stand, in, inside your, stand Up Inside Yourself, that gave rise to reimagination of these sculptures. I took students into the Boston Common and we used augmented reality to revisit these sculptures as to whether they were justice restoring uh, and reparative narrative or not. And what mo most of them came up with was because Christmas Addicts was in the relief bottom half of that sculpture, they wanted to stand him up um, next to the obelisk. And they wrote research papers to back their, their decisions about that and use innovative technology to represent. So um, on the right, you see a rep representing uh, image of what they thought this sculpture should look like and that Christmas should be holding the flag. And um, there were some very interesting topics that let me know where the kind of thinking that young people are doing is gonna head us in the future, hopefully as they keep to it. They did not change the Robert Gould Shaw Memorial, the Shaw 54th, that was about the Civil War and Robert Gould Shaw riding on the horse uh, because they felt it adequately represented uh, a struggle in America and a hope for victory and triumph of humanity. Uh, another challenge that they did meet was looking at, as Devin had mentioned, the Lincoln Ball sculpture that had become an issue in Boston. But what I have found in the, um, in the realization of this sculpture is to look at where it initiated as a result of uh, the, the announcement of Lincoln's assassination, Thomas Ball was in Florence, Italy, uh, uh, or Belgium at the time. He went to Florence, Italy, where he had um, a studio and he erected the first one of these that was uh, the call for bringing a, in a, uh, in a non-named black man into the sculpture. Then that is the adoption that happens 
with the, in, the formerly enslaved people making their contributions to a sculpture being erected in Washington, DC that starts in St. Louis to then have an actual person be represented as the man who is kneeling beside Abraham Lincoln. When that sculpture was uh, celebrated, Frederick Douglass said, this is, not, this is not enough. And he did not like the pose of the kneeling man to, as this country has been founded on the issue of slavery, its property dimensions, and then Lincoln being in this paternalistic kind of uh, posture of levying freedom or issuing freedom. That was not pleasing to black leaders at the time, even though this sculpture then becomes a part of a gift in Boston, the same exact um, uh, replica, uh, the replica of it becomes the, uh, a, uh, a present to Boston. And it's titled there, Emancip Emancipation. When we look at it at the Park Plaza, it is then challenged by the students of the 21st century who I had in this AR project and said, well, we think that once again, this black man should be standing up beside Lincoln and that he should have his hand on the American flag and not just the chains that they break together. I found that the man who was represented here is a, a, a real live uh, uh, man who had almost been returned to slavery, whose name was uh, Acker Alexander. And as they look at his image, what is it that we bring to it in our suppositions of the myths that have been in a narrative, in a dominant narrative in America? What do we want our children to take from that? So the erasure of this and removal of the sculpture doesn't give us that opportunity to really talk about it in, 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 in the physical sense, but there is still history behind it. I've also been in, involved in a project and I'm going rather fast here um, just to carry it on and give Ulf a chance to do what he has to present to us that I know is gonna be magnificent. Uh, but here is a, a new marker in Boston that I had the opportunity to help create the content for and to uh, pledge its, its usefulness in our environment. And it is to mark and, and acknowledge the arrival of the first um, Africans who came in from the sea through the Middle Passage in 1638, arriving in Boston's Harbor. It is next to the aquarium at that harbor. It is the last marker to mark uh, a walk to the sea. And this one is called coming in from the sea that marks their arrival. And it shows you maps and Christmas addicts and others that go to building a black community. It has been looked at by students and others to celebrate the moment of some triumph. It is an acknowledgement in Boston's Harbor and it is about the Middle Passage that along with 38 other, 31 other um, uh, spots and ports in America in a design of a project by Ann Chin to mark these places where Africans arrived in America to build this country. Um, so last but not least, I wanted to say something about the emancipation sculpture that is on Columbus Avenue in Boston done by Mita Warwick Fuller. And on the other side of that park, she is doing, Mita Warwick Fuller is announcing this in uh, the early 1900s. And at the end of the park is a step on board, Harriet Tubman step on board by Fern Cunningham that is, um, dedicated in 1999. So that part represents this idea of emancipation by two women who studied at the same school in Paris, two black women making their mark. And it's significant that this is a voice that should remain as the students had, uh, had said to us was that it represented some understanding of rather than like the ball sculpture and paternalistic freedom, that these people are stepping out on their own fruition and not knowing what their fate is gonna be, but they're doing it themselves, that self uh, agency. And so um, the, the object you see here, and this is my last slide, is a, a mon monument that is um, an example of some of the more recent works that have emerged. Uh, this one has, manifested itself in, in Philadelphia, but I thought it was so um, uh, indicative of the kind of sculptural uh, considerations we are now giving to things like even an e everyday object 
like a an Afro pick or an Afro comb that does have its history and its development from the African continent over into America. And it then has a cultural envelope that is about the, um, the care and the substance and the weavings and the hair of a people. So these kind of considerations give us new ideas about the images that we can depict and what they mean and how they mirror community. So um, with that, I will um, end my talk, but I do wanna say that our tools for affecting a reparative uh, narrative, an expanded narrative rest in a rep our uh, restoration and reparative approach to the aesthetics in monuments. Thank you, Lamerci. Um, this, this had the impact I knew it would, and, and, and to your point, we haven't even heard Ulf's presentation yet, which is just that we're not gonna have enough time. I wanna hear more. I wanna geek out on all of this. Um, I wanna uh, just note um, in the chat, Sarah and Ron, thank you for your contributions uh, and some context and perspective as well. And, and just encourage all to be active in the chat, um, sort of as you, I grew up in the church. So if there are, there are moments, call and response as, a, as an educator is, is welcome. So if there are moments that you hear, things that stick with you in anyone's presentation, please don't hesitate to drop them in the chat. Um, Lamerchi, I wanna um, come back to this idea later in the conversation of, I love how you called it, representing monuments. And so as your students did through, through AR, um, as a means to make more representative monuments and sort of how these monuments can mirror our community and, and expand our narratives. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, Ulf, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Devin and Lemerci. Thank you so much. We are in the very center of a really, really rich discussion already. That's really, uh, for me also, like uh, talking from a European white background, it's very, very inspiring. And, and I'm very glad to be part of that conversation now. So good evening or good afternoon, everybody. I'm sitting here in Berlin and uh, Berlin, Germany. We have evening already. Thank you so much for this trustful invitation. And uh, yes, again, Lemerci, I'm very excited to, to, to meet you and Devin and also everyone from Goethe and now and there. My name is Ulf Aminde. My The pronouns I use are he, him. Again, I'm based in Berlin and I'm speaking today about the memorial at Kolbstrasse in Cologne, Germany, a memorial as an active place of commemoration, as a social place of commemoration, which does not close the past because there must be no closure. And I'm speaking on this from a critical whiteness perspective, um, trying to be uh, an ally. So remembrance in general is a very important subject in Germany. And of course, there are a lot of discussions around the remembrance of the Shoah, the remembrance of the Second World War and of all that emanated from Germany must never run dry. But at the same time, a uh, like hotly contested debate is emerging, especially in these days, also in Germany about its own relationship to violent colonialist crimes and its own understanding of racist imperial and colonial politics. So that's just to give you like a little insight into also many, many debates which are kind of running in nowadays. And another field in the context of remembrance relates more to recent history. So that's the field where I'm more engaged in. And to the time after the Second World War, it's, it's more about the histories of migration, the histories of guest workers of color in the East and West in Germany, and also about like racial violence and neo-Nazi terror. And an essential part of these debates is always the question of who has the right to remember. And for me, that's a very, very inspirational question. So I... You know, that's the reason why I'm working on, 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 on it. So it's like, who has the right to remember 
and who does not have the right, who speaks and who listens, and why, to quote bell hooks, is the all-important question here, because this is how affiliations are formulated. I'm uh, sharing my screen now, because I also want to show you a few images. The Kolbstrasse in Cologne in Germany is a shopping street, very general, very beautiful, very vital shopping street with a migrant and post-migrant character known far beyond Cologne with many large and small shops. And the street is located next to the former Karlswerk, uh, like a huge cable factory where many of the so-called first generation guest worker, so-called GastarbeiterInnen were employed. And when the shops in Kolbstrasse became empty due to the withdrawal of the factories, former workers moved in and started their own business. And that's very important now because the Kolbstrasse came back to life. There was a lot of self-employed and self-confident entrepreneurs with their own post-migrant economies, which shaped the image of the street today. And it was precisely here and precisely because of this, that a nail bomb containing 200 carpenters nails exploded in front of a barbershop in Cologne's Kolbstrasse on the 9th of June in 2004, exactly one year to the day before the murder of Ismail Yashar in Nuremberg. The bomb aimed as a mass murder injured more than 22 people, four of them seriously. And now for seven years, the victims and those directly affected were investigated in a perpetrator victim reversal. The police used every opportunity accused to accuse the owner of the barbershop of protection records, mafia conflicts with Kurdish organizations, drug traffic, or I don't know, involvement in red light milieu, whatever. Although the shop owner had seen and recognized one of the two perpetrators. Incidentally, the victims of the attack were not offered any psychological counseling or therapy during that time. Instead, they were monitored, suspected, and put under pressure for seven whole years by police and tax authorities. So for seven years, mistrust among each other thus also grew in the Kotstrasse. And I'm sorry to mention all of that because it's also hard to hear. But I need to talk about that because I'm, I'm working on a, on a concept of commemoration where we try to work on an anti-space to, to, to actually create something which is in opposition to it. It was not until 2011 that it became clear what those affected and directly affected had long suspected. Both attacks, like another bomb attack in Cologne in Propsteigasse in 2001, both attacks were motivated by right-wing terrorism and were committed by the NSU network. The hairdresser Hassan Yildirim later said, that day I felt like a free bird because we couldn't take this pressure from the police anymore. So in their racist, racist ideology, the attacks clearly aimed to unsettle post-migrant society. The racist investigations of the authorities, the seven-year perpetrator victim reversal, the insinuation that the residents had something to do with the bombing, and above all, the lack of solidarity of the city of Cologne with the residents of uh, Kolbstrasse, with those affected and directly affected. All this is what the people in Kolbstrasse call today the bomb after the bomb, and mean by this the racist investigations and insinuations against themselves. So in 2015, I was invited to develop a concept alongside other artists in a competition organized by the Cologne NS Document Documentation Center. And after many discussions on site with those directly affected, those affected and people in solidarity of, of initiatives, anti-racist initiatives like Kolbstrasse is everywhere. And in cooperation with the author Svenja Leiber, the concept of a house that can no longer be attacked by Nazis was developed. The proposal was un unanimously chosen by the jury, which also consisted of those affected. And an essential part of the chosen concept is the location. A public square is to be built at the direct entrance to Kolbstrasse, invisible connection and relation to the attack aside. And you see the black part here 
is like where the bomb had been exploded. That's the fundament of the hairdresser's shop. And the idea is to copy paste the fundament of that, of that very house at the entrance of Kolbstraße and to set up a public space there. So the concept of the memorial is divided into three parts. The memorial consists of a six to 24 meter concrete floor slab, which is a one-to-one -one copy of the foundation of the house where the nail bomb exploded in Kolbstraße. And is it working? Yes. And uh, an augmented reality app on the concrete floor slab allows a digital anti-racist media archive to be called up. Here, survivors will have the chance to speak up as well as those affected by daily racism and its inherent violence. Thirdly, the memorial includes an established committee of those affected and directly affected of racist violence, which is responsible for the selection and production of the media, the digital media, for this digital anti-racist archive. At the entrance to the Kolbstraße, a public square is being created. I find that very meaningful. It's, it's really about producing a very concrete space, the Berlichte Square. It will be a counter space to the racist suspicions and, investigation, and investigations against the post migrants and is based on intensive cooperations with residents, those affected and directly affected, and initiatives from the neighborhood. I'm coming to the end. The Kolbstrasse Memorial combines the concept of remembrance and the question of who has actually the right to remember it all with a future that must be claimed in the present and is thus constantly renewed by a society of the many. The public space becomes a counter space to the silencing, to the perpetrator victim reversal and to society's disinterest in the perspective of those affected and the structural as well as institutionalized failure of the authorities. A counter space where those who were not listened to in the investigations can have their say, as well as those who are not being listened to today in their current experiences of violence and everyday racism. So there's so much to say about this concept, but also about the realization of this whole project. But I think for now, there will be more time to, <coughs> to talk about it later. Thank you so much. It's, again, I have to say, such an honor to speak to you and especially to meet Lemerci, but also Devin. I'm looking forward to have a conversation now with you. Thank you. Thank you, Ulf. Uh, and just like with Lemerci's presentation, uh, I want more. So I'm going to find ways to weave in both um, participant questions as well as some that we prepared for you into this discussion, because I think folks want to hear more from, from both of you. Um, well, if I put a couple of uh, quotes from your chat just now in the, in the chat, and uh, some that have come up since then are just this, the future must be claimed in the present. Um, and so I'm going to come back to you um, about this memorial. And so um, it's a question for both of you, but if I'd like to start with you, the, the question was going to be what makes a successful monument in your opinion and in our times. And if you could share positive examples of monuments and public engagement in them as we reimagine, reimagine uh, the monument landscape. I'd like to start with this um, sort of counter monument that you've you were speaking about um uh in Kultstrasse. i'm gonna i'm gonna butcher so many things so i, I want you to just uh correct me in the process where, what is the where is the location of the monument yes ex it's exactly as you said and uh you said it perfectly it's a Kolbstraße in cologne and in germany it's a very in beautiful cologne. Vital Steve, would be really nice to meet you there uh, one day. I would love that. I would love that. That'll be the, the second stint of my traveling with my four-year-old. Um, so when you talk about this anti-racist archive, you know, 
can you can you draw out and you spoke to some of this can you draw out some of the aspects about community engagement and that push us in our thinking of reimagining uh or representing as Lamerchi named it um our monuments what are some of the sort of the key takeaways in this experience that you've had um when we think about who has the right to remember uh and the uh public spaces becoming countering uh, spaces for silencing, as you named, and other experiences. We'd love to just hear sort of a little bit more about sort of what makes this uh, monument special and sort of what we can learn from the work that you've done. Yeah, That's thank you so much. Thank you so much for the question. It gives me also an opportunity to become more precise. And um, like the, the most important idea of this monument is that those communities people who, who are affected by like racism, racist violence, have the opportunity to speak up and it's all about like their perspective. I, of course, they already, everyone is already speaking up, but this is like an official place, an official public space also, where people can listen and can learn to listen also. So again, I'm trying to say that the, perspective of those affected by racism is being put in the very center here. And there's like, that's a huge difference to a lot of other um, official ways of commemoration. And, and I would say that the, like, it, it really comes to the core of, of the concept when, I'm, when we are also going to uh, set up kind of a committee um, uh, uh, with people um, uh, uh, who, who actually really also come from that very perspective. And, and this committee will have the opportunity to work on the selection of the medias which will be shown in this augmented reality um, a digital app. So this gives like the opportunity to put their perspective in the very center. And I find that very meaningful. I, I actually really have to say, and, and exactly from there, I, I also, I'm very much interested in that intersection of um, um, uh, giving a, also like a stage for uh, their perspective and in the, with the intersection of setting up a public space. So to locate it in this also public realm uh, of the public architecture of the city. So this intersection for me is a very powerful question because as we all know, the public space is like, uh, it's a battlefield. Yes, I love this. And I, I wanna actually, Lamerti, before I come, I come to you, I just wanna, um, this is my big push in all of the spaces that we curate is to have actionable items that folks can can actually apply to their their lives. So if you have anything else to share, sort of, Lamertine mentioned this idea of uh, petitioning the state governments to possibly affect change. When I think about what what has been curated there in Germany, um, I imagine that there could be pushback. And so when you talk about, I think it's the right process of involving those directly impacted to be a part of the selection committee and be a part of the uh, production itself. What took place beforehand to even allow for this space to be curated and, and, and placed in a public space? Um, if, if you're able to share anything to that, that component. You're asking- Ulf, I was asking Ulf, if you are able to share sort of what, what led to the, the ability to make, to create such a space. Yeah, I, it's again, and I actually really mean it. Thank you for this question, because of course it's all based on community. It's all based on, on also like uh, uh, years of uh, resistance. It's, it's based on, on, on years of speaking up of political struggle. It's, it's based on, on years of organizing and, and trying to, to also claim the right to speak up, right? And, and the right for visibility. And, and this is, it's, as, as I said, it's, it's all there already. It's, it's just like that we, we need to invent tools to also transfer this realm into the sphere of representation and, 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 and to give it more visibility. So for me, like when, like a very direct answer to your very important question is 
when I came the first time to Cologne and, and I realized this whole also political struggle and context, I realized that's already the monument. Like the, the community is the monument. The political struggle is the monument. This whole social movement I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging, I, I have a huge respect for it. That's the monument, it's commemoration. Thank you, Ulf. Lemurchi, I would love to create space for you to respond to the, the original question, but also to anything you heard from Ulf. Well, I, a number of things popped in my head as a discussion was carried, carried forward. And I think one of the things that helps me to anchor the conversation in ways that are real is to look at pop property dynamics. Who owns the space? How is the space then um, given power? Who is connected to that power to be able to allow for memorialization in a particular way to happen? And I think what Ulf has done with that space is to give it uh, a more democratic uh, feel and reflection of community in Boston. And there is this, this has been going on forever. When we look at um, who owns property, who's let in, who's kept out over the past two years, we have gone through this pandemic of, of, of um, a continuing pandemic highlight though of racism and, um, and disease, but one that, bears this idea of who can be led into a space and who can be kept out. And it is all within the, the avenue of who's in charge, if you will. And so when we go back to look at this idea of what erasure has become, um, I um, investigated a story about the um, abolitionists of the 1850s who were against the sculpture of Daniel Webster being on the, um, the state house grounds in Massachusetts, in Boston. And they actually wrote a petition to get that sculpture removed. So this idea of the removal of, of things that do not necessarily represent the best of us, it has been a challenge. When we look at um, a project that I did, uh, I can say from experience that the, the new urban monuments projects with young people involved a survey of over 200 people and what they would like to have in a space, what they would like to see reflected about them and their family. Uh, 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 the, the question about what would a grandmother who's taking her child through the neighborhood be proud of in presenting in, in terms of what manifests itself in as permanency. When we look at this, the, this global view of how monuments shape public history and shape public opinion and shape public experience, the surveys reflected what were some of the people's favorite monuments, what were some of their question about monuments, and then what they might project as a monument. And, and the responses ranged from one that was uh, quite ethereal, if you ask me, that was a, a mobile monument that had aromas that would affect people's senses of smell to those that would be more permanent in ideas of politically based um, orientation. So um, in looking at this, the right to do something gave us a project in Boston that has now manifested itself in the King Memorial the Boston King, King Boston project, where uh, there, were, there was a selection committee of the artists who would then be juried and have a finalist uh, opportunity. And there were five of them. And then those five models were vetted in communities, in libraries for people to respond to them in ways that would say what we want, what we don't want, where we want it to be. All of that was a consideration. And so from that, educational centers will be had that will address this idea of how we live in together in this space and what are the ideas that project out of that. So I think there is this moment of looking into future of the voice and agency of community in the investment 
of these uh, public memorials and public spaces that can't be ignored anymore, whether they're to be removed, whether they are to be erected in new ways, whether they're to be side by side each other, the, the old idea that may have not been uh, representative of people, and then that new idea. So um, I think it's all still in a space of, um, of, uh, of being effective, and it's all in a space of, uh, of quite the vacillation between how do we tell the history when we remove our, uh, that monument? Does it become a benign space? just like where lynchings happened and now they are no longer, you go by there's a green, a beautiful tree and a pasture and you would never know something happened there. So what are our considerations is still in flux. Mm -hmm. I think this is where we're seeing dialogue come up the around whether um, the removal of monuments is the right thing as much as amending what the plaques say, how, how, how the stories are told of these monuments um, and, and which, which is better, right? Telling yes. the accurate and, and, and harmful past. Right, um, and then also we, got, we have not looked at how like in the 1960s, the mural movements that became monumental, the big idea in communities to reflect the social voice of people that had no had not had power in that way before. So there are monuments, then there's memorial space, then there's this affectation with the new, new technology as Ulf has used and that I used with the students to present new idea, but to, but to have community have responsibility with that. I'm sorry. So this is a really great segue to um, our third and final question for you all before we move on to uh, audience Q&A. Uh, and you've touched on this a little bit, but I would love to hear you summarize sort of what would your ideal future of this landscape look like through public art? And then specifically, if you're able to share with us, when we talk about the who has the right to remember, uh, there's also a component that has come up from both of you of, of responsibility also. So um, and roles that folks play. So what are the sort of who has the rights, who has the responsibility, and then what are the roles that we each play in amending our histories through monuments? And so that, like when we think about this from an artist's perspective, from educators and students' perspective, from families' perspectives, broadly to legislators, sort of like what from your purview would be an ideal future of this landscape across those sort of different stakeholders? And, and, and this is a popcorn. Uh, I'm going to make it a free for all for you. <laughs> you can rock, paper, scissors if you need to. Well, I think importantly, um, we, can, we can think about even uh, thinking about future and what gets memorialized, what gets commemorated, and what gets uh, at least acknowledged is to look at what people who in their neighborhoods when uh, let's say a teenager is lost too soon by some kind of tragic um, uh, circumstance. We see the, the, uh, the erection of, of uh, what I call neighborhood memorials around telephone poles that uh, ha have a photograph of the person themselves that's, that's lost or a, um, a white painted bike if they got uh, hit on a, uh, on a bike and uh, unfortunately in an accident, that these kinds of spontaneous responses to an event or the loss of a person or the memorializing of a moment become some substance to what can drive something to be a permanent piece uh, of acknowledgement of what an issue, violence is an issue. Uh, um, the, the idea that um, people uh, uh, meet their demise by an accident, that's an issue uh, and how we can somehow um, address that. So I think uh, the curation by community can be a positive um, element of how we look at the archives of community history, the 
the people we want to represent, I, I keep asking the question uh, in thinking about restorative justice, why does it have to be around war? Why does it have to be a hero who's sitting on a horse or a so-called hero sitting on a horse with a sword or a, a gun or, uh, or something in that regard that is to be the big idea? Certainly that person is supported by an army or a group of men or has to travel with others to support his actions. The same as was a statement by Martin Luther King. He did not want to be memorialized or have a big sculpture because he said it is the people who have given him the power to, to lead and to go forward. So when we think about those kinds of uh, uh, envelopes or cauldrons for this kind of investment, and we think about the built environment as uh, we, we enter in that space, what is it that will be prevalent that we want to remember, or we want to underscore in human, human experience that lifts us up? I, I just can't imagine that we wanna go to a space that's gonna take us down the road of negativity. I, um, and in looking at what people have responded to in the projects that I've been attached to, that we are now moving toward enabling response, enabling power of the communities, individuals collectively and not, and their voices to emerge in a way that needs to be re responded to with resource. What are the resources that are gonna make it happen? And how do we then call on that? Thank you, Amirchi, I love that. Uh, Ulf, I'm gonna give you a chance to, to respond and or add on. Yeah, I, I actually really have to say, uh, I fully love it, what, what you're saying. That's exactly what I'm also interested in, like as an activist, but also as an artist. I think there's so much homework we have to do to, to make it happen, what, what you're saying, because when it comes to monument, to, a mon to the concept of a monument, like still is there are so many images of an objectified past, like, and, and I'm, I'm very much interested in, in understanding commemoration as a process. And I'm, I'm very much interested in transforming commemoration from an object into a process and and into an active like process okay. something we actually really have to do it's it's also labor it's critical anti-racist labor we we have to do from different positioning right yeah. and and i'm the more i'm i'm meeting people who share that interest <laughs> or who already have this like come with this kind of knowledge the the more yeah i feel also the trust that it's 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 getting more and more into this direction but now like uh the merch what you're saying that we need to talk about resources that's important like of course there are the great artists as you are one of of those the great artists are there. The great people are there. The communities are there. Everyone has has the knowledge. So now we we just need the resources because there are great concepts out there about commemoration projects, and there are, there is so much also like knowledge and understanding of that commemoration. Of course, has to change. Of course, has is actually coming with the opportunity of transformation, right? Social change and transformation. So. We need the resources to to get like the money to the great projects and to the to the great people. <laughs> That's something I find very very important. Yes. It's a little bit general what I'm saying, but we all no. know it's it's a very precise demand, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's it and it's the the resources and and access um, to to power and decision making. Murchie brought up earlier as well, yes. and so so. Um, it, however difficult the path may be to gain to attain one, like you need all of the above, right? You need the community engagement, but you need them to then also the merchie. When you talk about this, uh, the King Boston project, it's not just sort of soliciting the input for one slice or one area of the process, but engaging throughout. So it's not just hey, where do you want this to exist? 
Where do you not want it to exist? You want to be a part of the selection committee. And Ulf, it sounds like you've incorporated aspects of this into this project, into your project as well. So I want to turn things over to our audience. I know you all have been very patient and, and been filling the chat with some really incredible questions. Um, the first question is one for both of you. Um, because what we've what we've talked about is sort of this concept of amending histories, but also to give um, shape and, uh, and, and, and life to our present as well. And so the question is, how do you balance that? So it says, why is it important? This is from Allison Crony. Uh, why is it important to memorialize history when history is changing and society learns and evolves over time? Could monuments and memorials be living and changing with time? Um, well, I think I want to take a stab at that. In terms of, thank you, Allison. Um, Allison Crony is one of the people who was involved in the Elliott School, um, where I had uh, a, a residency with young people for new urban monuments. So I'm very pleased she's here. Um, the idea that there can be phases of monumental space or memorialization is a is a process as Ulf um, uh, alluded to that you know it's not just that thing or that object but what is the process and then what is the educational opportunity to continue the process as a part of the monument um, and we have these innovative kind of technologies that help us to do that but we also uh, can create within um, the computer space a way of people engaging and being interactive in the process of examining and re-examining a particular space. Um, um, memorials, memorials give rise to a moment. They, you know, crystallize that space or a moment. What is it that about that moment that um, can evolve from that moment to another moment is a question that we would have to ask each other in, uh, in terms of any particular monument. But, in, but looking at, at, at it as a process of how we proceed in the future or we advance generationally across an arc centuries with monumental presence, the big idea that keeps looming is if we are looking, let's say we look at this area of justice. So justice, what is justice as it evolves from that moment of that sculpture or that memorial or that monument to another moment? Are we still in progress of democratic principles and ideas and you know whatever ideas that you wanna perp uh, perpetrate or keep going or um, permeate these monuments with? I think that is up to us as citizen, citizen artists, uh, uh, concerned citizenry um, to, to make those moments possible as an ongoing process in phases. And does this memorial mean anything to us anymore? Might be even a question. So invested in the resources for maintenance and sustainability of a project might be the way that we um, structure it as a planning process to have moments that are funded to do those things. Yeah, I really love that you both continue to come back to um, uh, process over product um, because it's in those decision-making um, processes that then determine a, a monument's permanence, determines who's involved, determines who is commemorated, uh, who or what is commemorated. Um, and so, Ulf, it, I get the sense that what you all have created is just this, if I'm not mistaken. It is living and it is changing with time. And it's because it, it's mixed media, the, 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 there's, um, the permanence is determined by, by the curators. Is, it, is, that, is that accurate? Yes, totally. But I also want to say, Devin, like you, also you come with a lot of knowledge on uh, about like education and the potential of education, and and uh, when it comes to processing rather than like 
uh, commemoration as an object, we, we can talk about like education. We can talk about the potential of like educating, mutual education also, right? Like who's who's uh, able to tell their stories, right? And and who's listening? So this is such a powerful, very fundamental question. So and. Uh, and I, I, of course, there, there will be, there, there are great projects out there where, where also these questions can, can, can be raised, like in, in, in front of like an object, or a statue, of course, it's possible, but still, you need like uh, the artistic intervention, right, you need <laughs> like the inspiration to also get these statues uh, to transform them into something living. But we have seen so many great examples from Le Merci before, so that's very inspiring. Yeah, and I, I, I want to add to that. Thank you so much, Of I really appreciate your work. It's, it's just amazing um, and uh, so rich in its, in its power to, to, uh, to keep going. And I love that. Um, but I also want to say that do we design our curriculums for our grade school children in terms of thinking that they are the big idea? Exactly. That they may have big ideas that may be monumental. I don't even know when I came into the vocabulary, uh, across the vocabulary word of a monument. I may have been 18 years old by that time, but I looked at a very fabulous project that was done in New Orleans where they're engaged, they engaged when this uh, a subject matter of challenging monuments, they engaged in the third grade a curriculum that had them to create their own monuments and what they wanted to say. And so the investment was you have voice and you have agency. What do you see? So I think that in terms of education, not only in terms of education of what's already out there, but in terms of igniting the possibilities for new ideas in our children through their development uh, of, uh, of understanding what is public space. Wow, commemoration as empowerment work, amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this is why um, I promise no one, no, no one uh, asked or paid me to do this, but it's why um, spaces like this one are so important um, now and there that you're creating. Um, and again, Lemurchi, I'm just gonna add on to your shout out to Allison Crony and the Elliott School for doing similar work of, of, of bringing in, um, different stakeholders into these very important conversations um, so that it's not just uh, it's not just artists it's not just educators it's not just students right but but we all need to to come together to to make these uh, to be a part of these processes that you all have laid out um, I'm going to move on to it our, our next question which is from Claire uh, and this one's for you Ulf. and it says um, in response to earlier your, when you were describing the the memorial um uh she first noted that it, this is very fascinating uh so can you tell us more about the competition process were shortlisted designs publicly displayed or was the selection process closed to the public and then if you could say a little bit more this is the second part of the question about how the code strauss project relates to your previous work yeah, also Claire, thank you for, for these questions. Um, the answer to the first part is uh, it was half public because uh, 10 artists were being invited to contribute with a concept. And I was uh, one of them. And, uh, and, and then the, the selection was kind of, uh, yeah, it was a jury and, uh, uh, mostly by uh, people from the Kolbstrasse also, so those affected by, by racist violence and uh, from the community but then like the the um uh, the final result uh, of the jury was then a public exhibition so it was kind of a half public public uh, process but like the interesting po um, uh, point for me was that i have met the members of the jury when i was like presenting my concept but i have also met them kind of on an eye level because I brought a concept which is mainly focusing also on public space. So I was claiming for a space in the real, in the realm, in the architectural realm. So, so where also the, all those politics of the, of the city of Cologne arise. So where like the very concrete question who has actually the space to speak up 
is a very, very important question. And on, on this question, we had the chance to meet. And, and for me, it was very also touching to, to, to understand that we've been kind of hitting a point together. So, and then the second part, thank you for this as well. In my artistic project, all of my artistic projects, I, I relate a lot um, to the rich uh, US-based uh, art history on, on uh, 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 social art. And, and I'm, <laughs> I feel very much inspired by also your rich art history on engaging in, in social communities. And, and uh, that's where I also understand myself as an artist. I, I see a huge relevance in working with communities, also initiating social projects. And uh, while also at the same time, also critically questioning myself. So, uh, uh, the, and, and I find this very meaningful also to um, kind of negotiate also this kind of criticality in, 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 the, in this surrounding. It's sometimes not so easy because uh, to make it, to make a very complex story, very interesting. I'm also coming from filmmaking and uh, the one, the person behind the camera has never the uh, is never allowed to hide themselves behind the camera. That that's my political opinion. So, in other words, working with the communities also means that I have to, of course, it's also about me, and and it's also about like engaging as a person with a certain positioning um, uh, in these communities. And I find that very meaningful and very inspiring, also. I love that. As someone who likes to stay behind the camera, Ulf, uh, that, that resonates and it, and it is important for us to be out in front of uh, the work that we are championing. Um, our third question. Oh, sorry. The Mercy, I was just going to say that sometimes that being out in front is, is great, but sometimes um, given the opportunity to step back and that the voices that have not been heard or have not been uh, able to be responsible um, to enable them is also a part of the process of working with the community. And yes. I just like to say in the, yes. I'm a part of the selection community for committee for names who that have um, um, been to be memorialized around the King Memorial that were active in Boston during the civil rights era have been asked from community to, to put their input into who they think was special. It might not have been a, an order, orator. It may have been an architect. It may have been, you know, someone who had freedom schools. It may have been all those things. And so without stepping back, you don't give that kind of uh, agency to the community, but taking responsibility to, to Ulf's point to show yourself, you know, being out there and that you're a part of this. And so, yeah, it, I think that that arrow is I going both ways. I appreciate that nuance of, wow. of, of being, being uh, you, you can, can lead with, with empathy, with, you can lead with, with, through partnerships. And it does not mean that you are completely at the forefront, but, um, but the responsibility is there. I, I really appreciate that nuance. Um, our third question comes from Denise. And so Denise says, uh, the creation of permanent monuments takes a lot of resources and also requires skill, ease, time to navigate government processes and politics, which reinforces power imbalances and problems with uh, representation in monuments. What other examples of monument projects open up the process of initiating monuments or deciding what to memorialize so that it's not so top down? And so do you have other examples? Is there anything that you all are personally working on in the moment or know of? Well, the, um, there was a project in Philadelphia on monuments that gave me some ideas about how you engage ideas to come forward by survey, by asking people like, you know, you, you, you hear these uh, often, uh, uh, supported projects and reinforced things that say, well, we took a cross section of so and so, and and I often say, well, I wasn't in that cross section to offer my idea or to offer my opinion. So the 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 kind of open ended kind of processing that can be a, a part of examining a space for something to be um, erected 
or to be there or to um, exist, I think has a lot to do with our commitment and it doesn't happen overnight, but our commitment to, to realizing more voices, to realizing an expanded narrative and a reparative narrative, to be able to hear and listen and respond to the listening of what somebody has offered, honoring each one of us as, a, uh, as important in the process, not just giving uh, the power to what is the the usual suspects, as I say, um, but to 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 honor that process of becoming larger in our humanity um, is a part of that engagement. And then we we pay taxes, and then what are we going to demand from the paying of taxes for art to the art commissions and and uh, the city and the state revenues that make these things possible. For any um, for any uh, municipality or or government agency, who are our representatives? And then you know, I think organizing like many movements happen kitchen table by kitchen table, if you will, and are successful because of the commitment. So that being this process that we think we sometimes pass a memorial said say, well, who was responsible for that idea coming forward? And we assume that it was some big powerful group or, uh, or legislator, but who influenced the legislator to do that? So I think that that arrow also goes back and forth for us. Um, and I, I'm, I don't say that I have all the answers. I don't have um, answers. I'm just putting forward what I think is a an experience that when I have gone to other countries and I I, I went to um, uh, Taiwan and uh, and uh, and Cuba and other places and Brazil and I looked at you know what is community power and how do other people globally reflect their desires of what community will be and I think the the same threads exist in all of those communities that I went to. It's like somebody's a watch captain. Somebody's, you know, it, it's organizing and working and networking across differences that bring this I, these ideas to the forefront. And because if we don't recognize that there are issues, we can't do anything about it. So that sharing um, humanly from one to another has a, a very important function, I do believe. Thank you, Lamarchi. Wolf, thoughts? I love that so much. And the question is also very relevant, of course. I, 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 trust, I just try to say that, that um, I see a huge um, importance to work on language and voices and, and the recording of voices. Like as an, I'm speaking as an artist now. So th there are a lot of polit political reasons why, why it's, 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 it comes with a very high value to, to stage voices, to, give, to, to, to make voices to, to listen, right? That people can listen to what people have to say. And that's the reason why I, I'm very almost I'm always very interested in in, uh, in 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 all those great critical audio walks, and there are a lot of great projects out there. And 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 it's also technically we could say it's kind of easy to also work on that. You don't need so many resources. You you don't need so much like um, uh, a power to, to, to bring these projects into reality. But in the same time, I want to also be the person tonight or today who's insisting in this intersection of, of, uh, of, of these digital media, it might be voices, recordings, videos, images, and the intersection of the digital realm and the public space, because sometimes I'm afraid that like the authorities and the dominant narratives, they also like to have the, the critical sound works because they're just everywhere, right? So it means they are not here, but they need to be here in this very, in, in this very concrete site. I hope I'm, I'm able to, <laughs> to, 
to get to to get myself to the point where I'm I'm really talking about the real politics and uh, and for me that's a very important question so I hope I'm I make myself understandable yes you both are and and so much so that um I'm I'm I, like I want to ask more questions uh we are running short on time I'm gonna uh, Annette I hope you don't kill me I'm going to ask this question because I th I'm, I'm hopeful that we can answer it really briefly and then and then turn things over to Annette. Um, but I think it's an important one that speaks to what you both are ju were just naming. And so this question comes from Philippe, which says, do you think that it is possible to see old monuments, um, colonial monuments, not as examples of structures of power, but only as places of social encounter without taking them down? And if so, how? Well, I, I I have been considering that a lot in, in terms of do we remove removed pieces of evidence of history having happened as it did and manifested itself in that day um, that it was erected? Or do we remove it and then put something else there? Uh, and addressing this in terms of a permanent or semi-permanent st structure poses some problems that, um, as Ulf just iterated, that there are some ways of probably negotiating that space with um, digital codes, uh, telling a story of that space, if it's removed, that there is some uh, acknowledgement of something that was there and an educational possibility, an educational moment that can be had through our devices that we carry with us, a phone, or uh, you know that there's some QR code that will ignite a conversation and or record your response to what you hear um, as a part of the on, ongoing living memorial or questioning or questioning a memorial. So. Um, the designers are, are the people who are really thinking about how that space is planned and used. And many times it's 20 years to 30 year planning of a development. And if that is put at the table rather than included at the end, uh, in the beginning of a process, we may have more ways of affecting that colonialism that is purported by that object. So um, that's all I can think about yes. right now. I'm sure you might have, mm -hmm. the questioner might have even some answers. Thank you, Lamarchi. And Ulf, in a minute or so. Yeah, in a minute, uh, less than a minute. I have We're gonna solve about. all the world's problems in, in, in 60 <laughs> seconds, go. <laughs> I have I have two answers. The the first one is a polite one. The 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 the, the first one is, yeah, I, I will not be the person deciding if 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 a monument like of uh, white supremacy has to be taken down or not. You know, like let's ask the communities; they should decide. You know. And now the the second answer is a very personal one, very direct. No, oh, tear that shit down. We don't need it. Of course, it's uh, yeah. <laughs> I appreciate your candor. Or... Sorry, <laughs> no, I appreciate and I appreciate both answers. Um, and there was something there for everyone. I think the um, unsolicited input that I'll give because I'm always advocating for student voice uh, and for the, the 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 voice of the unheard. Um, what I've uncovered from what you both have shared as a proposal here is. Um, Lamerchi, your students have, have um, represented monuments. Um, and, and Ulf, your monument um, and exhibit showcases the voices of the unheard. When you think of combining those two as representations of monuments, right? Where you get to hear these voices of uh, the community in response to the existing monument, I think to the two, pardon me if it's Felipe or Felipe, um, the, in, in, in response to this creating discourse and dialogue 
uh, rather than taking them down. I think there, you all have presented so many different avenues and processes that could lead to that necessary dialogue um, if we do not take them down. And in some cases, we'll tear that shit down. Um, so um, I wanna continue this conversation for, for hours and hours on end, um, but we are at time and um, I'm going to thank both of our panelists for being here and sharing candid, uh, thoughtful, uh, and, and endearing responses to um, our, our prepared questions and those of our incredible attendees um, this afternoon. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn things over to Annette to close us out. But thank you all. Thank you, Devin. Thank you, thank Devin. You, Devin. Thank you to you all. I, I'll second that. This was an amazing conversation, really rich um, exchange of ideas. Thank you for sharing your projects with us um, and your insights in this really important debate, which um, I discovered goes much beyond monuments. It, it's really about equity and power structures and and you know things that are in our society and and really deep in there that we really need to look at. Um, so I know we all have to go back to work. Um, it's been great spending this lunchtime with you. Uh, before we go, I just wanted to let you know that we have a second panel in the planning. It will take place on Tuesday, April 19th, uh, probably in the evening. It will be in person here at the Goethe Institute, but we will have a way for you to see it online as well. And we have um, the Boston-based artist from Colombia, Juan Obando, um, who will be speaking with um, the German conceptual artist, Misha Kuba. Um, so I hope you can join us for that. You can find more information on our website. Um, which was shared here in the chat. And there you can also see a bunch of other webinars and dance performances and film screenings that we are also hosting in the next couple of weeks. So thank you so much to Ulf, uh, Lemerchi and, and Devin for this wonderful conversation. And thank you to the audience for, for spending this hour with us. And I hope we will see you all again very soon online or here in person at the Goethe Institute. So take good care, everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>